Hi, everyone. This is Aaron. I am here for Sola Network, and we are speaking with uh, Pastor Jay Kim today. Jay Kim, he's an author of um, two books that I've read recently. One is Analog Church, really good book. And the second one is Analog Christian, his most recent book. Um, this is all about um, being a disciple in the digital age. I reviewed it for Sola Network, and I'll put the link in the show notes. You can always just search for uh, Analog Christian Sola Network Review. Um, but I want to talk to the author, uh, Pastor Jay Kim. Uh, Pastor Jay, thanks for being with us here today. Would you mind introducing yourself to our audience really quick? Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, for having me on. Really honored to be on with you and uh, love the work that you all are doing uh, with the Sola Network. Um, yeah, my name is Jay Kim. I uh, grew up in Northern California in uh, Silicon Valley and have been here basically my whole life. I was actually born in South Korea, but moved to San Jose, uh, Silicon Valley when I was pretty young and never left. So I've been here, uh, yeah, almost, you know, 37 years or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been in local church ministry for uh, almost 20 years now, serving in a variety of capacities, began working with um, students, you know, youth, uh, high school and middle school students, started a college ministry, spent some time as a church planter, uh, was on a church planting team, and then several years as a teaching pastor. And now I, I have the joy of serving as a lead pastor at a church here in the Silicon Valley. Um, your journey and just kind of your, I guess, um, placement, sovereign placement by God in Silicon Valley, I would say, um, is incredible. I, I think that it allows you to see um, so many different things uh, from that perspective in relation to the church um, and now with discipleship. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to these themes that you bring out in your book. Um, there's these themes of contentment, resilience, and wisdom. I was wondering if you could unpack those themes for our audience and um, especially like your view of them coming out of Silicon Valley. Yeah, you know, uh, those are the themes in the book, primarily because the this book, Analog Christian, was really born out of my own angst, like my own personal sort of wrestling with a variety of things. Um, uh, and especially sort of when the pandemic hit, I, I found myself really just deeply mired in discontentment and fragility and foolishness. And uh, I, I started asking myself these questions, you know, I don't, I don't think this is this can't possibly be the life that God has for me. This doesn't seem to be the sort of life of fruitfulness um, that the scriptures seem to indicate uh, God God has for, for me. So I, I just started asking a lot of those questions of myself personally. So the book really is a, is a reflection and a prayer. You know, it, it's it's um, it's way more personal than the first book that I wrote. Sure, and sure. it's it's really uh, sort of, you know, contentment is, um, I just, I found myself really lethargic and apathetic, uh, constantly disappointed, but not knowing exactly why I was disappointed, just living in a constant buzzing state of disappointment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that led to incredible discontentment. Um, I found myself in recent years, uh, really thin skinned and, and feeling fragile and, um, easily offended, you know, quitting on things easily and sort of looking inward and asking, this is not me, this is not who I am, but but it is who I am, it's who I'm becoming, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so the need for resilience really sort of bubbled to the surface. Uh, and then in the exhaustion of it all, you know, I found myself really tempted toward just foolish decisions, wasting time, spending mental energy on things that don't really matter, you know, um, one of the things I've I've really thought a lot about was how much I how prone I am to spending time on meaningless leisure instead of meaningful work or meaningful rest, mm -hmm. Sabbath, you know, and there is a difference between those things. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was just this sort of utter lack of wisdom, you know, in my life. So um 
really those themes came about because of because of my own lack of those things and ultimately i think that god by his spirit when he begins to cultivate the life uh, of the spirit inside of us it leads to contentment resilience and wisdom i think it is in many ways um, they are the markers of a life that have found their foundation in Christ, you know, as the source of our contentment, yes. as the source of, of all confidence, you know, making us resilient, no matter what comes our way. And as the source of wisdom, you know, helping us to see and navigate the world in our lives in a way that's godly and God honoring, you know, and, and holy, really, at least in pursuit of, of holiness. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I think we were all feeling those things but I think that you were able to articulate it in a way that's that's very relatable uh, and understandable and also presenting a picture of hope for us to uh, look towards. Um, yeah. One thing that was extra relatable to me uh, as an Asian American, maybe not like specifically the situation you went through, um, but understanding what you're talking about is uh, this story that uh, that you had between you and your mom. Um, I was actually wondering if you could maybe do a quick retelling of that, uh, because people who don't read your book, they're not going to hear it, but maybe it would get them interested uh, and also would speak to our our audience here at Sola Network, where we try to reach, you know, the Asian American generation. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up uh, um, an only child with a single mom. My parents separated again when I was really young. My dad stayed in Korea and then my mom and I moved here to the Silicon Valley. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I was like most kids, I was sort of a rebellious preteen and early teenager. So when I was in, uh, you know, when I was a young, young boy, sort of elementary school, middle school age, um, I got in a huge fight with my mom. I, you know, yelling, screaming match. Uh, and I, you know, I cursed at her and then I was so scared and so angry, I hopped on my bike and I rode my bike to a friend's house that was like several miles away. I had to ride down this yeah. long expressway and I didn't tell her where I was going. This is well before uh, the day and age of smartphones and cell phones and pagers. I didn't have any of that. There was no find my friend. My mom didn't know where I was. And I went to my friend's house and I'm like, hey, I'm, you know, can I just hang out with you for a while? So we're hanging out. I'm just basically trying to stay away from my mom. Long story short, my friend's mom comes home, calls my mom. My mom comes to pick me up. And I'm like fearing for my life at this point, you know, right, 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 right. fiery Korean mom. <laughs> I cursed at her. I like ran away from home, all this stuff. So we drive home and just utter silence. You know, she doesn't speak. I'm like, my nerves are and my anxiety is just running uh, at max, you know, and yeah. we get home and I just go straight to my room, close the door. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to ride this out. Hopefully right. <laughs> he gets tired, goes to bed and forgets about it tomorrow. But eventually, you know, um, I can smell, uh, food, you know, cooking in the kitchen. Um, uh, and it's like, you know, the comfort food of my youth, like just awesome Korean food, you know? And, and then my mom, uh, knocks on my door and she says, Hey, come to the kitchen. So I'm still really afraid at this point. And I go to the kitchen and my mother has laid out um, just the full spread of, you know, panchan and like incredible food, right? Some, a stew. And I think there was like some fried fish and uh, so, and I'm hungry at this point. I'm like, Oh my goodness, I'm still nervous. So I sit down <laughs> and before we eat my mom, um, begins crying she has tears in her eyes and she looks at me and she says in korean she says jay these are the first words out of her mouth you know since everything went down she says jay you are my son and no matter what you do no matter what you will always have a seat at at my table and i just remember breaking down even in my young age i remember breaking down and weeping i went and gave her a hug um, you know, even though I was hugging her, it felt like her love was sort of enveloping me. And it was, you know, that was decades ago. I still remember it as clear as day because it was just this beautiful, tactile, physical embodied picture of just a sliver of what God's love for us is like. Um, and this is not to say that God 
you know, let's sin slide or uh, that, you know, you do you live your life however you want. God's always just going to love you. And it's all warm and fuzzy. That's not it at all. You know, there, there needed to be confession and repentance and all of those things. But the overriding, um, you know, resonance of that experience, the thing that still lingers with me is the love, the overwhelming love. And, uh, it, and it did lead me to repentance. You know, I apologized and asked my mom to forgive me and, you know, um, restored our relationship in that way. But, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I know I'll never forget that story. Um, one, because it just reminds me of how, what an incredible woman my mother is, but two, more importantly, because it's such a, a, a physical sort of real life, tangible for me experience of what the God, uh, the love of God is like, at least in small part, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it was a, it's honestly, a, you know, it's a powerful story. Um, it's a simple story, I guess, from, from, from your youth, uh, yeah. but it obviously made a huge impact on you. And I think when I was reading it, it made a huge impact on me. I, I could really feel the emotion and sense what was going on there. Um, so I want to say thank you for, for, I guess, being open and, uh, honest enough to share that, that experience with us as, as readers. Um, yeah. your book, it, it that, it talks about, um, you know, the fruit of the spirit, right? Like that's really what your book is centered around. That one was about love in particular, I, I think, right? Yeah. Um, yep. uh, there was another uh, a kind of connection that you made um, in your book. And this one was on, on patience. And um, you made the connection between patience and abiding in Jesus and how that should affect our relationships that I thought was really insightful. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to say about patience, especially today in the digital age when everything is so fast, when I can push a couple of buttons and 30 minutes later, food is magically at my door or, yeah. or whatever, you know, and, yeah. and there's a lot of benefits to that. But one of the one of the subtle sort of dangers of how fast and how easy and accessible everything is becoming is that we are growing increasingly impatient. You know, we're losing our aptitude and our ability to wait or to linger. You know, we, yeah. we, we are so fast today to move from one thing to the next to the next because we have so many options and everything is so accessible. And again, uh, that's not all bad. You know, life has become far more convenient. Things have become far more um, accessible and, and easy in some ways. And, and that's helpful, you know, in, in some ways. But I, I think a lot about Jesus's words in John chapter 15, when he says, you know, remain in me and I, and you will bear much fruit. So in other words, this is sort of a simplistic way to put it, but it'll get the point across. If you want to live a fruitful life, like an actual fruitful, meaningful life, a life of, of um, experiencing the spirit of God, cultivating uh, the stuff of God inside of you, you know, moving you toward more and more Christ-likeness. If that's the sort of life you and I want to live, then Jesus makes it really clear. We have to remain in him. And um, that word remain often gets translated abide. And, you know, in, in most translations, it's remain because the word abide is kind of an older English word. But mm -hmm. in the original language of the text, uh, the word we translate into the English word remain or abide is actually the verb form of the noun for house or dwelling place. Yeah. So this is not like um, go to the grocery store and remain in line until you can get your stuff and then go home. And this is not, you know, go to the Starbucks and wait in line until the barista makes your coffee and then get out of there. This is like remain as in the way you remain or abide at home, mm. you know, like mm. the word abide is connected to the word abode, which mm. means mm. home or house, like the place you dwell. And so essentially what Jesus is saying is if you want to live a fruitful life, if you want to experience um, the life that God really truly has for you and experience fruit in your life, then you have to make Jesus your home. Mm. You know, you have mm -hmm. to remain in him in the way that you go home and remain at home. And, you know, in connection to patience, it's really interesting because, you know, for anybody who's moved to a new house 
or a new city or a new school or gone to a new job, um, they'll be able to relate to this. Uh, between first grade and my senior year of high school, those 12 years, I moved 14 times. And I went to four elementary schools, <laughs> one middle school, and two high schools. So I went to seven different schools in 12 years. Yeah, it's too so much. I, I, I moved a lot. It's way too much. <laughs> I moved a lot. And I, I distinctly remember every time I went to a new, I moved to a new house, a new apartment, or a new school, um, it took a while for it to feel like home. Mm. So if we allow impatience to sort of run amok in our lives, it is going to be almost impossible to truly remain in Jesus because it takes a while for places to feel like home. Mm -hmm. Like it requires mm -hmm. patience, whether it's a new job or a new house or a new city, it, it takes a while for it to really feel like home, for it to mm -hmm. really feel like your dwelling place. Mm -hmm. And I think often we think about discipleship to Jesus as a series of to do's, you know, like a to do list. I read my Bible for two minutes this morning. I prayed before I ate all my meals. And, you know, there you go. I'm done. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's sort of an, those things are not bad. They're really great, but they're incomplete. And it's sort of an impatient way to go about discipleship to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Real mm -hmm. discipleship to Jesus, meaningful, life changing, transformative discipleship to Jesus, I think, uh, is seeing um, Jesus as our home and understanding and embracing and reckoning with the, the reality that it will take a while for that to take hold, yeah. for the presence of Jesus in every sphere of life, for that to feel like home, like your dwelling, it, you got to be patient you know, yeah. and, and you yeah. got to stay yeah. with it. So I, I just think it's, it's extraordinarily important uh, that we embody patience in our discipleship to Jesus, particularly in our day and age. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think the reason why that one stood out to me, um, I work at like the intersection of healthcare and technology. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm always in this fast paced, hurry up, let's get this done type of world. Yeah. We need to get this done as soon as possible. And um, I, I think when you put it in the terms that, that you did, it, it, it made me really assess how does, how, do, how does that thinking, you know, affect my, my spiritual life. Right. And of course yeah. it should all be connected. Right. Um, but I, I do see the disconnect between the two worlds and I want to kind of, you know, assimilate them all together to, to be spiritually formed together. Um, yeah. There, there is another uh, sense where, um, where, where you talk about ordinary faithfulness, uh, not fame, and that one, that one uh, hit me as well because you know I, I dwell in the the online social media world, yeah. right, and, and we all do. Um, I, I, you talk about uh, this a little bit in your book, um, but I want to press a little bit further and ask you how does this apply to you as a pastor? Uh, you know, this, this concept of ordinary faithfulness, not, not looking for fame necessarily. Right. Um, yeah. And let's just, let's just be real here. You wrote a book, right. And you're, you're a published author. You're getting your name out there. Um, people know you. Uh, how, how does this apply to you specifically? And maybe it can relate to uh, our pastors that are listening as well. Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. I, um, you know, the first thing I'll say is, I think recognizing that ego and pride uh, is a reality in my life is first and foremost. And naming it is really helpful. Mm, mm, <laughs> Na mm. Like saying it out loud is, is really helpful. Mm. So the ability to admit that, yes, my intentions can easily be skewed and, and often I am tempted by uh, motivations that are ungodly, you know, to name it, I think helps at least loosen its grip on my mm. heart. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things I've come to learn 
and I'm not famous by any means, but, <laughs> but certainly some of my more recent work has been public. It's public in nature. Right. So right. one of the really interesting things that happened, this happens to you too, you know, as you run some of the social media stuff for Sola and your, um, you know, all of your different reviews that you do and, and sure. a heavy sure. sort of social media uh, presence. Presence, right. Um, exactly. When, when our interactions are mediated by content. What I mean by that is, um, you know, when you, when you create work that is public and then people with whom you do not actually naturally and originally have a personal connection to, but rather the relationship is now mediated by content you have created. Mm -hmm. I think that it's really important to, name and accentuate the reality that our exchange is based on a, um, a work I've created that you have found helpful. Okay. So, and, and I think that's important on, on a personal level. So what I mean by that very practically is um, I try very consistently and I don't do it well all the time, but I do try internally in my head and in my heart Every time I do an interview like this or someone asks me to whatever, speak at an event yeah. or whatever, I try really hard. Uh, I actually learned this from a friend, a, a mentor and a friend who also has work that's that's very public and is like way more famous than me. Okay. 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 Um, he, he's, he's told me multiple times, Jay, anytime you offer a work to the world, whether it's a sermon or a story, or a book, or an article, or an interview, or whatever. Or a photo, or just a post. Or a photo, or anything. Yeah. yeah. A ask yourself the question, um, how can I help? Mm. Like, how can mm. I help? How does this help anybody? Mm. Mm. And, and that's been really helpful for me, because it is a faithfulness question. It's a question that reorients and recenters me on the original calling of God on my life, when mm -hmm. I said yes to entering pastoral ministry, which was essentially to say, can you um, help people draw closer to me? Can you help people be formed more and more into the likeness and the image of my son? Mm -hmm. And, you know, asking that question always has been really helpful. So right before I got on this podcast with you, I, I just said a quick prayer in my mind, like, Lord, help me just help this conversation to be helpful to some people. That's it. And it's not about my brand or my book or people knowing my name or being asked to speak at events. It's not about any of those things. It's just this 30, 40 minute conversation Aaron and Jay are having. <laughs> can it be helpful to some people in Jesus name? Mm. And if we can, if we can do that, then at the end of the day, I can stand before the Lord and say, God, I tried to be helpful, which means I tried to be faithful because mm. I think that was your calling on my life. And I think that applies whether you've written a book or your work is all that public or not. If you're a pastor, then you're a public figure. Yeah. Sunday after yeah. Sunday, you get up and there are people who sit there and give you their undivided attention for 30, 40, 50 minutes. Mm. And, and I think we have to recognize that's not normal. That's not a normal <laughs> thing. Like. And as broken vessels, it's not any, there's nothing in me personally that deserves the, you know, undivided attention of that many people for 30, 40 minutes a Sunday. Sure. Like, yeah. Nobody yeah. should listen to me talk for that long and, and you know, just sit there. But it, it's because what I am hopefully offering them is not me. It's, it's the gospel mm. and the goodness mm. of Jesus. Mm. And it's a gift I've received to steward and to extend to others. And so can I be helpful in extending that gift? And if I can, then that means I'm being faithful. And I think at the end of the day, that's all that matters. So reminding ourselves, uh, you know, when we stand before um, the Lord someday, he will not ask us, how many books did you sell or how many mm. followers mm. did you have on social media or mm. how famous did you get? He will simply wonder, you know, and ask like, how faithful were we? Mm. How faithful mm -hmm. were we with, uh, with what he gave us? You yes. Know, just, so there you go. Those are, are some thoughts. Well, uh, I think your prayer is answered because I am, I'm sitting here and, um, 
you know, I asked you a question about pastors, but you you saw right through me and you applied it right to me. So that's good because I wanted you to do that. <laughs> Even though I didn't ask you to do it, I wanted you to yeah. tell me to help me out here. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I always try to make that's these awesome. podcasts help me, you know, get a personal help out of this. Um, awesome. Well, Jay, I want to respect your time here. Um, and this, this will be our last question. Uh, I do want to make it a little bit more personal for you. Um, what's your final push? Um, to our listeners here, as we see ourselves living in an increasingly digital world. And I know that you have young kids and they're, they're living this right now. You know, we're trying to navigate it, but they're, they're living, you know, growing up in this. Um, Yeah. Yeah. What's your final push to your kids, to people who are listening to this? Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have really young kids. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. So we try our best to minimize um, digital interaction in our home. So, and that's, it's easier now because they're young, you know, we'll see how we do when they're teenagers, but um, yeah, they don't have any digital devices, obviously. Uh, They watch very minimal TV. Um, They have very little screen time. So uh, we'll have like movie night on Fridays where they can pick a movie and watch a movie. Um, but that's pretty much it. You know, sometimes if I have, uh, the Warriors game on, cause I'm an avid Warriors yeah. fan <laughs> up here in Northern California, sometimes they'll watch a little bit, but they're not super interested. So we, we limit their screen time. They're not on computers or, um, you know, phones at all. Uh, iPads maybe a little bit for travel, but I do think about it a lot, you know, as they age and become teenagers and, Uh, One of the things I think about most based on some of the research and the data that's coming out about social media is what we will do with social media with Mm. them. You know, I just, I think the dangers of social media are becoming increasingly apparent. So, you know, as a way of sort of like a final push for, for those who are listening to the podcast connected to social media, I think I would just encourage, and I think most people know this, but hopefully it's an encouraging reminder just remember you are not defined by your digital life. Mm. You know, your digital life is not who you are. It's not even close to who you are. And other people's digital lives are not even close to who they are either. Mm. Human beings are complex nexus webs of emotions and motivations and feelings and thoughts and ideas and histories and stories. And our digital lives are just glossy curated snapshots Mm. of the things we want people to think about us Mm. and it actually typically most of the time i think works against the sort of authenticity and transparency and vulnerability and messiness that's necessary for true communal connections to happen Mm. so that would be my charge you are a human being made in the image of god that god has created for deep meaningful relationship with him and with others. And so um, lean into those realities and, and, and make sure that, uh, you know, you don't get so caught up in your digital life that you begin to believe the lie that um, your digital life defines who you are uh, or defines others uh, in terms of who they are, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. So there you go. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. Jay, thank you so much for your time. And uh, thanks for letting me know a little bit more about you too and getting to know you personally as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. It was uh, so fun chatting. (laughs) 